So good afternoon. Um, I welcome you all, close and not so close. I'm Frank Mecklenburg from the Leovec Institute, and um, we have our in-house audience, and we have numerous people who are following this uh, presentation online, and uh, this will also be recorded and eventually available on uh, the new YouTube channel of the Leovec Institute. It is my special pleasure to invite you today to a conversation uh, between two scholars. And uh, all of this goes under the title, The Second Robbery, Aryanization and Restitution of Jewish Property in Austria. And um, this is based on, a, uh, on the work of the presenter, Rachel Blumenthal, who is one of our current Jess Gerald Westheimer Development Fellowships. Um, Rachel Blumenthal is a trained lawyer. She's also a historian and um, comes to us from Israel. Um, and um, this is um, a work that requires um, sort of deep insight. And uh, so from her different fields of study, she's bringing this to us. Um, and let me just um, tell you a few of her previous accomplishments. Um, so the, the right to reparations, the claims conference, and Holocaust Survivors is her most recent book. First book. Um, and um, so, and she has been focusing in her work on the history of Austria and restitution, post-war and before. The person that she is going to talk to, the commentator and respondent, and is uh, Elizabeth Anthony, who comes to us from the Holocaust Museum in Washington, where she is the director of a visiting scholar programs. And she also has worked uh, on the topic in a related fashion and her book, The Compromise of Return, Viennese Jews After the Holocaust, sort of focuses right into this conversation. Maybe this um, presentation will be a little unusual in that Rachel will go through her topic by way of a PowerPoint presentation, and Betsy will respond to that as we go. So it is a discourse, discussion, dialogue, dialogic form. Um, and then afterwards, we will have questions from you. Um, and uh, for those who are from on the internet, please put your questions in the Q&A. And uh, we will have uh, somebody here who will monitor this, and then the questions will go to the speakers. So I give the floor to you. Okay. This is working. Um, well, thank you so much um, to Leo, Leo Beck uh, Institute for inviting me to come and to, to moderate um, this discussion with Rachel. It's, it's a pleasure to work with you. Thank you. And um, it's, it's a pleasure to work with Leo Beck Institute, and it's a pleasure to work with you, Rachel. I, um, as, as Frank said in his kind introduction, my, my work 
has taken into account a lot of the, the kinds of things that Rachel is a real expert on and focuses in on. And um, so it makes sense that we're here together today. Um, so we, we worked together to sort of structure a, a, a conversation. Um, and, um, and Rachel has some really wonderful visuals. I think maybe to get us started, I, I'd like to ask about your motivations and your interests. How did you, how did you get started working on this topic? Okay, so um, hello to everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for coming in person and online. That's clear. Um, and thank you very much to the Leo Beck Institute for funding my research. Thank you to Frank Mecklenburg and a special thanks to Betsy. We met in London in December and it's a great pleasure and an honor that you have agreed to conduct this dialogue with, dialogue with me. So when I made the transition from law to history, I was interested in the post-war uh, era. I examined transitional justice for my uh, master's degree. I examined trials of a judge of the People's Court um, and how they failed in Germany in the 1960s. I, um, recently, I've been looking at uh, these refugees in post-war Austria, very inspiring, brilliant people. And my dissertation was on the claims conference. And um, in the course of my research, I discovered an organization about which I've never heard, an organization with a very long name, because all Jewish institutions have very long names. It's called the Jewish Restitution Successor Organization, and it's known by its Yiddish acronym, IRSO. And this organization was headed by the late Ben Ferentz. He was a lawyer, and he got together a group of lawyers, and they ran around um, occupied Germany in the western zones and they went to the land registry offices and they searched for property that had been owned by the Jews before 1933. They filed claims and they claimed and often usually got restitution. And I was interested in understanding whether there was any similar activity in Austria, whether there was an ESO in Austria, and if not, why not? Um, on to a more personal level, um, on the left, that's my grandmother, that's Wilma Lichtenstern. My mother and my grandparents were born in Vienna, um, and they left before the war. My grandmother owned a pharmacy. She was a pharmacist, and um, as a child, I was very surprised to hear that she went back in 1947 to Vienna, and she lived there. And it always seemed to me, as a child, and even as a grown-up, that you go back to Vienna, Vienna has been bombed, and it's like the German film, The Murderers Amongst Us, you're sitting, you're living next to people who you don't know what they did during the war. How could you go back? And I asked people, I even asked Hannah Lessing, and no one had a very good answer. So this is why I decided to do my research. Right, thank you. As, um, it sounds familiar, although it, <laughs> it's not a part of my family history. <laughs> Um, that too, being in Vienna and seeing people there who had come back, obviously. Um, That's right. Just made me start asking questions, and so I, I understand completely. So, I know that in your work, um, you talk about three stages of plunder. Um, and well, would you tell us about that? And, I th and also, you've said um, that in, in Austria they went to to work perfecting the plunder of Jewish property. Could you, maybe you could explain more about that. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, Austria uh, was very different from Germany, both in the violence that erupted immediately after the Anschluss and in the speed at which things occurred. Um, and so I divide the plunder into three separate stages, although in fact, in practice, some of them happened concurrently. Um, and the first stage began when the Wehrmacht crossed over the border into Austria on the 12th of March, 1938. Um, and this was basically looting. And this stage um, ended in about May, 1938. Um, and so you have stories of people like William Shira, who tells the historian, William Shira, who tells 
how he saw Nazi officers uh, coming out of the Rothschild Palace, and one has a gold uh, gold frame painting, another has silver cutlery, and another uh, example is of uh, someone who wrote a book about his. Uh, it's a semi-biographical book. He's called uh, Wolfgang Georg Fischer, and he talks about how a Nazi came into his apartment, looked around, liked very much what he saw, and said, that's mine, I'm taking it, and just threw out the people who were living in the apartment. Um, they had to leave with nothing. Um, and so that was one form of plunder. Um, and this ended, more or less, in May 1938, although it happened again, uh, at the time of the November pogrom. Um, the Germans were concerned about what they called the wild Aryanization um, because the property didn't necessarily end up in the right hands and because it was, uh, there was popular public resentment or fear that if you start with the Jews, you might end up uh, looting their pro property as well. And so from, 19, from April 1938 to 1941, you have state-controlled systematic plunder. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and um, then from 1941, which is when you have the big deportations, um, so there were approximately 200,000 Jews in Austria before the war. By 1941, you only have 60,000 Jews left, and they're almost all deported uh, to the east, and they're allowed to take with them one suitcase, um, and everything else is either pilfered or forfeited by the state. Um, and so those are the three main stages of the plunder. Um, I talk about the state the perfection perfecting of that about how so i wanted to talk about how the state controlled the plunder um, and so in april the 26th 1938 you have um this decree which uh, applied to all of austria all of germany all of greater germany um, but the, the the motive was this wild uh, looting in austria and uh, the decree said that everyone who was not an Aryan and had to fill out a questionnaire. And in the questionnaire, you had to list all your property. So on the right-hand side, that's my grandfather's questionnaire. Um, and um, there was no, in April, there was no Nuremberg laws in Austria. They were only enacted in Austria in May. And yet everyone knew who, who was a, an Aryan, who wasn't. So you have these forms where sometimes people say that they're atheist, and sub sometimes people say they're Roman Catholic. But nevertheless, for the purpose of the Nazis, everyone knows that they are not Aryans. And in the form, you write down your jewelry, your furs, your bank account, your securities, your business, and any real estate you have, and of course, your address. So that was the first stage. And then you need an office to oversee what's happening. So the Germans set up an office uh, called the Vermögensverkehrsteller in, uh, in May, and it was headed uh, by a banker called Dr. Hans Fischberg. There's, you have material of, on him. And um, he was a banker who had funded Hitler early on. Um, and um, you have, so what happened was that you filled out your form, and then you received a summon to go to this office. You had to bring with you all your property, all your movable property, your furs or your jewels, your paintings. And, um, and then uh, it was processed by the office. Uh, the gentleman on the right is someone, is a lawyer called Walter Kastner, and he was responsible for expropriating 102 big Jewish um, businesses. And, and I, I want to show you now by the type of business, type of property, what happened. So you went along to this office, you brought your jewelry and furs, uh, the office handed them over to the Doroteum. Uh, there's a picture on the right hand corner, right top of the Doroteum, which is an auction house, uh, which made a lot of profit. They sold the uh, movables to the highest bidder. Um, paintings were handed over to the property office, transfer office, and either uh, some of the senior Nazis liked collecting uh, artwork, so either they ended up in their private collections, 
some of them ended up in um, museums, and some of them were auctioned off by the Leopold Museum. Um, as for, um, and at the bottom, that's a picture of paintings that ended up in the salt mines in Linz with Hitler admiring the paintings. Um, apartments, so there were 60,000 apartments that were owned by, or not owned, they were occupied by Jews in Vienna before the Anschluss. Um, most of pe people didn't um, have title, they had a lease, and either they were kicked out or this Nazi order of, 19, of 1939 ordered the Aryan landlords to terminate the leases, so you lost your apartment. Um, and then you have businesses. So owners were forced to sell their business. Um, there was a huge range of different types of business. Um, and you were supposed to enter into an agreement with either your former partner or with a Nazi uh, par party member. Um, there was a, a vendor, a purchaser, uh, a price which was all, all almost, which was a fraction of the real value. Um, and proceeds didn't go to the vendor. They went into a, an account that was blocked so that the Jewish owner received nothing for his property, which he had in theory sold. Um, and for large businesses, um, we had this Walter Kastner who liquidated them. Um, and at the end of the day, you have those Jews who were lucky enough to receive visas to enter somewhere else. They, went to, they entered the, um, the Zentralstelle, the Central Office for Immigration. They filled out all these different forms. The office, uh, this was Eichmann's baby, um, they, uh, the office assessed how much property you had left and on the basis of this it almost all went into taxes. There was the flight tax and a levy and you came out with nothing. You'd lost your citizenship, you'd lost your apartment, you'd lost your property. All you had was a passport with a big J uh, on it and it was valid for two weeks and if you didn't um, use it then you were threatened that you would end up in a concentration camp. Thank you. That was a very um, clear and concise summary of a complicated process. Um, but now you have some more of an idea of how this systematic and organized um, appropriation took place. So now let's turn to the to the post-war and, and restitution. And this was a um, very complicated when restitution legislation went into place in, in Austria. It, it, Somehow effectively slowed down the process, if not if not ended it in many in many ways. So um, maybe you can tell us more about the legal framework for for restitution and the significance of the the third restitution law, and also that um, I know it's true that there was coverage for actually compensating the so-called Aryanizers who were losing um, property, wasn't there? Okay, so thank you very much. So Betsy, in her book, she describes about what actually happened, which is how people went back and they tried to go back to their apartments. Um, and if someone else occupied their apartment, they just moved into an apartment on a different floor. Um, but um, I want to talk about the legal framework. So the legal framework was established, the legal principle that was established by the Allies in 1943 in what's called the London Declaration. And according to this principle, all plunder of Jewish property was void. So in theory, it should have been easy for people who survived the war to regain their property. But it didn't work out like that in Austria. The government, so in, the, in April, before the end of the war, you have a new provisory government head, head by, headed by uh, a socialist, um, a man called Karl Renner, and he um, so immediately established a government, whereas in Germany you have to wait for four years until you have a federal government. And at the outset, Renner set the tone when he said there would be, there would be some sort of um, com restitution, but compensation of every little Jewish merchant or peddler for his loss was out of the question, was inconceivable. And the finance minister, who was Reinhard Kamitz, said any kind of restitution was out of the question because Austria did not cause any damage. Um, this is a very legalistic 
argument that between 1938 and 1945, there was no Austrian state. So the Austrian state didn't owe anything to its former citizens. The fact that the former citizens had lost everything because of acts performed by Austrians was totally irrelevant as far as the Austrian government was concerned. And, and nevertheless, eventually they did, or fairly soon they actually did enact seven acts of restitution between 46 and 49. Um, and I think a major incentive was the fear of the Soviets. So the Soviets were the first to uh, enter Vienna and there was a big fear that the Soviets would try and seize, and they did seize property um, as spoils of war. And so the restitution acts were intended, the legislation was intended to counter the Soviets. Um, and there were these seven laws. The first two were about government held property. The last four were about relatively minor issues of intellectual property um, and con service contracts. Um, and as Betty, Betsy said, the, the main law was the third restitution law and it was enacted on February the 6th, 1947. And it laid down the principle that property that had been seized from Jews or from victims of uh, the, the National Socialists um, should be restored. Um, and there were pluses and, and minuses. So on the plus side, um, there was a presumption created by the law that if the property had belonged to a Jewish owner before the Anschluss, um, and it had been ended up in someone else's hands, that it should be restored. Uh, so the burden of proof was on the side of the Aryanizer. Uh, another um, big um, advantage was that you didn't have to be an Austrian citizen or a resident to claim your property. On the downside, first you had to be able to recognize the property. You had to be able to say, that is my string of pearls, that was my fur coat in order to be able to get it back. Since most people couldn't do that, that ruled out um, that form of restitution. And there were lots of different categories that were not covered by the law. Um, and another um, drawback was that there was a deadline. So you had to file a claim by June 1954. But the most, as Betsy said, the biggest problem with this law was that the Restitution Commission was authorized to order the Jew, Jewish owner, the original owner, to compensate the Aryanizer for his, first of all, for the purchase price, and secondly, for the investments. And this is crazy because the original Jewish owner never received the consideration for the sale, the so-called sale. But um, the way it worked was that they had to compensate the Aryanizers. Um, and now I want to show you um, how this worked in, in, in practice, the different types of uh, property and how it works. So jewelry, furs, and furniture were irretrievably lost. Um, the leases had expired, and the restitution laws made no provision. So you didn't receive any compensation for your lost apartment. Um, Large businesses were more successful in gaining, uh, in regaining uh, their properties. So uh, there is an example. I have two examples. One is an ammunition factory in Hirtenberg, which is in Lower Austria, and this was owned by a gentleman called Fritz Mandel, whose main claim to fame was that he was one of the seven husbands of uh, Hedy Lamarr, and he was defined as a half Aryan. And he escaped before the war. Uh, the, the factory was taken over. And after the war, he managed to regain the factory. So that was a success story. Another success story is um, a paper and textile industry, which is still very big to this day. Now it's called Bunzel. Then it was called Bunzel and Biach. Um, and the owners were very clever. They structured the ownership so that there was a Swiss holding company, and the Germans didn't want to fight with the Swiss, and so it was relatively easy uh, to regain their um, control of their, uh, in, uh, their concern. Um, but other 
businesses, it was a much sadder story. So over 80% of small businesses, 26% uh, of industrial firms and 91% of private banks had been liquidated. When the Nazis aryanized property, they wanted to create a new brave world with a very efficient, profitable economy. Um, and they decided that lots of these businesses were not profitable, so they shut them down. If they shut them down, there's nothing to restore and there was no compensation. And finally, the bank accounts and discrimin discriminatory taxes were not restored and there was no compensation. And this compares with Germany where they did, they did pay compensation. Um, and, and so people were, um, received very little. The only um, major success story, and again, this is uh, qualified, was real estate. So um, it, there was two thirds, roughly two thirds of the owners were successful in um, reclaiming, in claiming restitution. Real estate is very difficult to hide. If you had lists of ownership, it's very high to, it's very difficult to hide the original owner. Um, in a, in twenty percent of the cases, uh, there were proceedings that started that didn't end, and ten percent of the cases there was no indication of restitution and 90 percent of the claims were filed by people living abroad 30 percent living here um, and the chances of regaining your real estate depended on who the arianizer was so if it was a state you had a much higher chance if it was a private person you only had a one in two chance and if it was a company you only had a, a third a one in three ch chance chance of, of, of uh, be successful in regaining your property and most or not most but at least half the people resold their properties because they had no intention of living in Austria they had to fund the compensation for the arianizer uh, and the prices in uh, post-war Vienna were very low there was a big depression this was before martial aid um, and frequently um, what the parties did and it's hard to find a paper trail but this is what happened is, or so I understand, is that the parties re reached an agreement whereby the Arianizer would pay a sum to the Jewish, original Jewish owner, and the Jewish owner would waive his or her right to any claim to the property. Um, and I have, um, I have three, three picture examples. So this is a lady called Edith who owned a car and she inherited two, two other luxury cars. This is not like today where everyone has a car. Uh, and she had a blue yellow Lancia and she filed, they were, they were stolen by the Nazis. In 1950, she filed a claim for restitution and the police property department said that they couldn't find them. There was no record. Although all the cars had car registration numbers. Um, Another example is of the Rothschild Palace. So Louis Rothschild owned this magnificent palace on Eugenstrasse with uh, lots of paintings and objets d'art. Um, and when the, after, immediately after Anschluss, he was incarcerated. The uh, building was taken over. The Zentralstelle, the central office for immigration, uh, was installed in the first floor. Eichmann moved into the second floor because this was a nice place to live. Um, and by the end of the war, all the contents had disappeared. The building was derelict. And um, Rothschild, who had escaped just before the war by the skin of his teeth and by paying a huge ransom figure, um, he was able to regain his property, but it wasn't worth very much. He sold it for a penny. And now in Austria, you have an office building which uh, is built after they tore down this derelict the building that was once a fantastic palace. Um, and finally, um, so this is the pharmacist. This is my grandmother's case. Um, so um, in order to regain her pharmacy, my grandmother, on the left-hand side, that's my grandmother's, um, you had to be a qualified pharmacist. But when the Germans took over Austria, everyone who was a professional, who was not Aryan, lost their profession, their uh, professional um, license. And so in order to regain the, the pharmacy, 
she had to requalify um, as an as a pharmacist. So she went back to Vienna. She redid apprenticeship, although she'd worked both in Vienna and in London as a pharmacist. And after a year, she regained her license and she could acquire the pharmacy, which like everyone else, she sold. And she used the money to buy a pharmacy in London where she uh, now lived. Um, and on the right hand side, this is a picture which I saw. I, this is not a picture, this is a real pharmacy. I was walking through Vienna in the middle of summer last year and there is a, an apotheca, a pharmacy, and on the, car, on the blackboard, uh, which is next to it, and I'm sorry that you can't see it, but it says that the owner, again, this was a pharmacy that had existed for, for I think, over a century, and the pharmacist described how it was aerianized and then restored to her. Um, and so this is still a live issue in Vienna today. Thank you. I was hoping that you would talk about your about your grandmother's pharmacy and, um, and tell us more about that. Thank okay. you. What about um, what about the difference between Austria and Germany when it comes to restitution? How would you how would you describe that? Okay, so there was a very big difference, and people who went through the same forms of persecution ended up with very different. Um, compensation, restitution, um, and there are a number of reasons. So one reason, I think, was that the Soviets controlled Vienna. In the beginning, they were by themselves, and later on, uh, Vienna, like Berlin, was divided up into four zones. But I think the fact that the Soviets were there at the beginning and that people uh, were unable to claim their properties because the Soviets weren't into private property, um, is a, an important factor, and I think also the Soviet control of Vienna deterred um, Jewish op organizations from operating there. So I think that's one of the explanations of why there was no IRSO, no Jewish Restitution Successor Organization in Vienna. Um, another uh, explanation is that in legal terms, there was a big difference between the definition of Austria and Germany. Um, in 1943, in the middle of the war, um, the Allies made this declaration in Moscow, and they had this crazy, I think it's crazy, idea that if they tried to find favor with the Austrians, the Austrians would abandon the Germans and help the Allies defeat the Germans. And so they made this declaration about Austria being the first victim of Hitlerite uh, aggression, um, but the continuation of the declaration is that they cannot evade their responsibility for what happened. And the Austrian government liked to quote the first part of the declaration and ignore the second part. Um, and they had this, this myth, um, this victim myth. And so the Austrians were victims, so they didn't owe anything to anyone because they were the victims. Um, and this is clearly very different from what happened in Germany. Um, there is a very big difference in the leadership of Germany and Austria. So in Germany, you have Konrad Adenauer, uh, who is the chancellor of the new federal state. And for whatever reason, he believed in the importance of reaching a settlement uh, with uh, Jewish organizations on compensation and restitution. Um, and this was totally different in Austria. In Austria, if you read sort of statements by politicians and churchmen about anti-Semitism anti after the war, you, it's difficult to understand how they could make you know, these declarations. Um, and I just brought one example. And this is Leopold Fiegel, who was the chancellor who replaced uh, Renault. And he was an Austrian nationalist. He himself had been incarcerated in Mauthausen in the end of the war. And he saw what happened to people at Mauthausen. Mauthausen was a terrible concentration camp. And, and he, uh, quoted, he has this quote about the biggest student massacre only began in 1942. By then, our Jews were gone, usually with some luggage, a, shop, a ship's ticket, and 200 Reichsmark. Um, and so, there, there was a complete lack of feeling of responsibility 
of liability. Um, and this had a very important impact on the outcome. Um, and this is like Germany, but the Aryanizers remained in Austria, whereas the victims had been murdered or, or left. Um, and there was a very, the Aryanizers in Austria had huge political power, um, and the government clearly wanted to um, cater to them. Uh, and finally, and, and Betsy's also talked about this, the government didn't want to encourage Austrian Jews to return. And if you prevent them from receiving compensation and prevent them from regaining their property, um, no one's going to return or very few people are going to return. Yeah. Yeah. It's really stark when you see it in, in those terms and, and, and the, the quotations just like that. Um, I think you wanted to talk a little bit about your work with um, on the claims conference. The claims conference. So, so yeah. uh, there are people here from the claims conference. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the negotiations. So um, after the claims conference completed the negotiations, the Luxembourg Agreement, um, they set up a committee called the Committee on Jewish Claims on Austria, and unlike in the German case, in the Austrian case, they decided to negotiate together with local Jewish organizations. They set up what they called the Joint Executive Board, and they began negotiations in 1953. Um, what they wanted was um, some sort of compensation for airless property, which hadn't been covered by the legislation, for the taxes, for the movables, for... Um, the leases, the 60,000 flats which had disappeared overnight, and even if they were leases and not title, they clearly had an economic value. Um, and there was discriminatory uh, legislation in Austria. In Austria as well, you only got compensation if you lived in Austria. So all the, va the vast uh, proportion of uh, originally Austrian Jews had left, um, and they received nothing. Um, and so they conducted negotiations with the uh, Austrian government. Uh, the Austrians were very good at procrastination. The talks dragged on for eight years, until 1951, that's right, eight years. Um, and the outcome was very um, unimpressive. The Austrians set up two funds, one in 56 of $21 million, and one in 1961 of $6 million. Um, and this was charity. This wasn't justice. This wasn't something that the Austrians owed. This was out of the goodness of their hearts. And because the sums were so low, uh, lots of people filed claims, but only um, people over the age of 60, uh, usually they had their claims were accepted. And again, all you got, if you were lucky, was $1,000. Um, Whereas, you know, under the German BEG, under the German indemnification law, you got every month compensation for the loss of your career and the loss of this and the loss of that. In Austria, if you were lucky and if you were old, you might have got $1,000. And I think what also bugged very much the German, the Jewish organizations, and here is a, a letter by Saul Kagan, was that there was this um, hierarchy of empathy. This is the, the term but used by Robert Knight. Um, so there were victims who were successful in regaining their property. And one of them is this Stahlhenberg, who was a, a Nazi. He was a fascist. He wasn't a, a Nazi. He was a fascist. He helped Dolphus gain power in 1934. Um, and he lost his property um, due to the Nazis. He had a, he had a Jewish wife. Um, and he regained this uh, fantastic building, which is next to the Dorotheum. Um, and so the Austrians, clearly they were victims who were entitled to compensation, victims who were entitled to restitution, and victims who weren't. Um, and this, I think, the, the uh, Jewish organizations found very difficult, apart from the fact that at the end of the day, the outcome was so um, small, limited. Rachel, there's so many, um, so many things that we could talk about and we will talk about, um, but time goes so quickly. I wonder if we could might... I could I just talk about my conclusions? Oh, please, yeah. Okay, thank oh, you. Sure. This is uh, so I, I have three conclusions. It's my fault. Um, 
first, what, strikes, what struck me was the complete lack of symmetry between the plunder and the restoration. And you have some of the people, this Walter Kastner was on both sides. He was erinizing and then he was returning. And you see the role of bureaucrats and unlike Magritte's picture uh, of the sort of blind um, bureaucrat, people were uh, acted on according to an agenda. Um, and the second uh, conclusion was the complete lack of accountability for the plunder. So for instance, Mr. Kastner went on to become a consultant to Austrian governments. Uh, I don't think, I mean, Fischberg was, uh, they tried to try him, but he got off with something very uh, minor. Um, and no one really paid for the plunder. And a lot of the people who's uh, ended up with Jewish property, um, nothing happened to them. Um, and finally, uh, what struck me as a daughter and granddaughter of survivors was the fragility of what we take for granted, state protection for our lives and property that can disappear overnight. Sorry for the somber note, and thank you very much. Well, if you don't have a somber note here, um, thank you so much. And I'm sorry to have, to no, have no, rushed you through. I, <laughs> um, but we do have a few minutes for, for, um, for, for questions. And so I'm sorry I don't know names, so I, I'll say I saw your hand first, and second, and third. Thank you very much, Rachel. That was really e excellent. I have a question about, initially, weren't the British and the French and the US running Austria until 1955? So I was a little bit confused how the Austrians were making legislation, and yet the, the military occupying powers were there. Who was really sort of running the show? And what influence in, in Germany, the US military powers had a big influence on promoting restitution? Why didn't that happen in Vienna? Okay, thank you very much, Karen, for the question. Um, there was, in Austria, a provisory government, and then there were elections, so there was a federal government immediately, sort of even before the end of the war, whereas you only have a federal government in Germany in 1949. Um, and what happened, what, what, what was different from uh, Germany and Austria was that in Germany you have Jewish property all over um, Germany and a lot of it is in the western zones where the US military are very helpful with restitution whereas in Austria 90% of the Jews lived in Vienna so I guess 90% of the property was in Vienna and the Soviet presence I mean it's true that uh, Vienna was divided up into four um, zones, but initially the Soviets ruled it by themselves, and the Soviets had undue influence on what happened in Austria, and so they prevented, uh, or this was, they didn't prevent, but they didn't enable restitution, and you had a government, you had a functioning government, federal government, that's enacting these laws way before um, Germany has a, a federal government. I would I would add to that just along with what you're saying that the Soviets in the beginning weren't weren't they just weren't doing anything about about it. So people did, like you said, I I've written about people just went back to their apartments and if they were empty, if the Nazi who had taken it had fled the Soviets, they just moved back in, or maybe the Nazi was still there, but they would move in downstairs, and and so people in the very beginning when they first came back did get things back, and then once even before the, the restitution laws kicked in, but once the other allies joined them and started getting involved, then things started getting taken back away. That's right. And, and, and so it was, the Soviets just weren't doing anything about it, and then once the rest of the allies got there, it, it started um, falling apart. I just uh, like a clarification. You used the word Aryanizers got this, and Aryanizers were paid and so on. Could you clarify who were these Aryanizers that you referred to throughout your talk? Okay, so I apologize. I should have made it clearer. Aryan is the term that the Nazis used <clears throat> for anyone who had no Jewish blood. Who was, and when they talk about Aryanization, the idea is is plunder by 
non-Jews. Um, and it's either plunder by individuals, by neighbors, by partners, or by the state. It's, um, and the people at the end, they, the Aryan owner, or the, um, they are the people actually in possession, but they are usually former Nazi members or former partners, not Jews. No, they, they were there once they ended up with the property. And they, in theory, should have, and some of them, they actually paid for the property, but the money, which was much less than the actual value, went into an account, and the, the Jewish owner received nothing because they weren't allowed, and then that went in, off into banks, into the Dresdner Bank and the Deutsche Bank, and, and that was the end of that money. So. Um, at the beginning, you showed this slide with the, um, with the process of the Aryanization and with the paintings, it says that they were um, auctioned by the Leopold Museum. But the Leopold Museum was founded in 1995 ah, yes. and opened its store in um, the year 2000. So my question is, can you explain the no, source you used that you're right. made you say this? No, you're right. So um, I, I saw that paintings were auctioned. I saw somewhere about the Leopold, but you're right. It was probably, it was probably later. You are right. No, not at all. It was not a, no, but you're, okay, okay. I, I, I'm corrected. So perhaps just a couple questions from online and then we'll have time for some more from the room. Um, uh, so first, more of a compliment than a question uh, from Jennifer Malvin. Thank you so much. Yours was the most clear and articulate lecture on Aryanization and compensation I've had the opportunity to listen to. Um, uh, here's another question from Elizabeth Frischow. Um, hi, Elizabeth. Uh, glad you're with us today. Um, she asks, did your grandmother ever talk about her feelings about Vienna? My mother who had to flee wanted to return. She loved Vienna, not the people so much, but the city and Red Vienna. Um, I know how this uh, exists and continues into my own generation. Um, and Elizabeth, of course, is the author of a book uh, of, of poetry called They Clasp My Hand, um, which is published in English and German by the Theodor Kramer Verlag and um, uh, deals with this um, sort of intergenerational aspect of Austrian heritage. Um, Austrian Jewish heritage, rather. OK, so thank you very much for the question. Um, my grandparents, so my grandmother, not only she went back in 1947, but they went back, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, they went back uh, in the summer to Bad Gastein, where they met all their friends who were uh, all over the world. Uh, my grandfather, who had been a lawyer, and he'd been the company secretary of a department store, Gerngross, which is on the first slide. Um, he never went back. He never forgave. And um, his life was, you know, he, he, instead of being a successful professional in a, a place that he loved, he ended up in London. He became, he was uh, incarcerated as an enemy alien. Um, and he uh, wanted to have nothing to do with Austria after they um, successfully managed to escape. Um, thank you. Um, can you please say something also about the 65,000 Jews that were murdered and the monument that was created a year and a half ago? Obviously, they might have had property they might have had descendants or whatever. I mean, they were the ones who lost not only property, but also their lives. What were the discussions in post-war Austria about restitution or Wiedergutmachung vis-a-vis the murdered Jews of Austria? So um, it's important to remember, and I, I should maybe should, but um, clearly, Losing property is, is nothing compared to losing your life. And, and um, I have relatives who were sent to the East. Um, and um, a lot of them were elderly because usually it, everyone understood um, 
as soon as the Anschluss happened, everyone understood that there was no future in, in Austria. It, again, this is different from Germany where people thought, because it was so gradual, people thought it can't get any worse. Whereas in Austria, it was clear that uh, you had to leave. And not everyone was able to leave. Um, and so usually it was the elderly people who were left behind. But there were other people. There was um, my, my hero is Ruth Kluger, who her mother and she, she remained behind. Um, and some of them ended up, like my relative, in Lodge, in the ghetto. And I don't know what happened, but he probably starved to death. Um, and Ruth Kluger and her mother ended up in Auschwitz, where they were lucky and they survived. But a lot of people didn't survive. Um, Betty knows more than me, but people ended up in Theresienstadt. Um, uh, people ended up in, 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 in all the different camps uh, in Eastern Europe. And um, I don't know of the Austrian government. So the Austrian government, much later, after the Waldheim affair, did uh, provide some sort of compensation. But in the and there was compensation if you were incarcerated according to the laws immediately enacted in, immediately after the, uh, the end of the war. Um, but I think very few people got any compensation for people who had been murdered in the Holocaust for the 60,000 Jews. The 60,000 Jews, 65,000 Jews, I think it covers, there were, I don't know, some of them included people who were unlucky and, and it had escaped like Anne Frank's family had, had escaped from Germany to Holland and were caught there. Some of the, these uh, Viennese people had escaped to France, to other countries, and were caught there. Um, and um, there, was no, there was no justice for them. Obviously, the uh, provisions made for compensation by the Austrian government were dramatically insufficient and unjust. Now, at the end of the war, uh, those, um, co those uh, uh, provisos of the compensation must have been listed or, uh, re or recognized by the Western countries and by America. Mm -hmm. Was there any sort of protest by the allies about the inadequacies and injustices being perpetrated on the Jewish survivors who had been victimized and their properties taken away? So thank you very much. Um, there, are, there were lots of complaints by people who ended up here and they wrote to the State, State Department here and they complained. And the Western allies did try to intervene. Um, and they, um, when the Austrians sort of, there was some legislation which sort of only wanted to compensate Austrians, the allies struck down the legislation. Um, but you have to remember that this is a time of the Cold War. The Allies were very worried that Austria would end up on the Soviet side, on the Soviet bloc. And so they intervened, but to a very limited extent. In fact, the two, the two funds, the relief funds that were set up to compensate the Jews, they weren't really due to the claims conference. They were due to pressure put by the United States government on the Austrian government to provide some sort of compensation. But either there was a limit to how much the United States government wanted to get involved, or there wasn't enough interest or care. Um, the British definitely weren't interested, and the French weren't that interested. Um, and so that is, is my explanation of why, um, why of the inad inadequacy um, and, and the fact that, you know, even though until 1955, Austria was, uh, was subject to the Western allies, the, the four allies, um, the compensation restitution didn't get very, very far. So uh, perhaps just a couple more questions from online. Um, first of all, 
Deborah Dwork uh, says wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, but we have two questions um, about uh, any sort of more recent efforts to ad address the inadequacy of, of this uh, earlier restitution. Um, one uh, listener asks whether the claims conference um, has any uh, official agreements with Austria now or has, has made any headway in getting additional restitution. And then um, Astrid also asks, are there any efforts by the Austrians today to compensate for the inadequacy of restitution processes in the past? Okay, so there's someone here who knows much more about the claims conference than me. Um, but um, in 19, sort of starting after the Waldheim affair, there were, uh, and my talk is, is, is only about the decades, the first two, three decades after the war. In, in, for, starting from 1995, the Austrian government did try to reach some sort of settlement. Uh, there were different rounds of negotiations, um, and there was some sort of compensation. Um, they set up a fund. Um, people, there were 20,000 people's claims were recognized, but because again, they limited the sum, people got very small amounts of their claims. Um, if it was insurance, you got 20%. If it was bank accounts or, or other claims, you got 10%. Um, and I saw they also agreed to reopen cases of restitution of um, real estate of um, businesses. Um, and I, I've read a number of cases where um, basically the claimants got nowhere. They said, you know, I mean, people made huge profits out of these businesses. Um, and so a claimant would say, I, I, I received the property back, but I sold it for a very small sum. And then someone sold it for 10 times, 100 times the sum. And uh, I should be compensated for that. And the Restitution Composition uh, Commission, and we're talking now about in the 2000s, um, said, that's your fault. You should have done better due diligence. Um, and we're not going to cover those losses. And so there was, there was compensation. But it was, again, very limited. I'm interested in the social class and how they found the Aryanizers. The gentleman asked about who were the Aryanizers. Well, I have the story of, my of who came to my father and grandfather's business, a man named Rudolf Schober, who showed up on April 29th, 1938. And we have a lot of information about what he did. And I don't know what his class was, so I'm interested in that. The other thing just I'll mention, my father was kind of a maniac, and he was so enraged about it all. He tracked Rudolf Schober down after the war in an American prisoner of war camp and included him in his lawsuit. Um, so I'm sure Rudolf Schober, who showed up in 1938, did not expect that Paul Frankfurter would show up again. But I'm curious, who? Who were they socially? I mean, what was the class of people who got recruited to go into businesses and go through the books? I mean, I have so many records about what they did. Well, this is it. it people had this idea that all the Nazis came from sort of fairly lowly backgrounds like Hitler and Eichmann. But this is what is so, I mean, I think it's surprising. You know, you think education counts for something and it changes the way you see the world. But these were lawyers, bankers, surveyors who were doing carrying out the plunder. So it covered everyone. So they, you know, the, 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 the classic answer is I was just fulfilling my duty. But then you have sort of the flip side where you have the restitution. And for some reason, you're supposed to be fulfilling your duty, but it doesn't look like the, the first time round. It doesn't look like the Aryanization. So I think the short answer is that it was, every, I mean, it came from all classes. It wasn't limited just to the lower classes. And it's difficult to understand, you know. And there were people, there were exceptions, and there were people who helped uh, Jews. And um, I think, uh, I mean, there were sort of, it, it, you shouldn't generalize. It's, dangerous to generalize. 
uh, there were good Austrians, there were bad Austrians. Um, but the picture that I receive is that it's not only people, it's not the mobs, it's not just people who have nothing, who are jealous of their Jewish neighbors. It's everyone, it's from all classes. And thank you very much. And I'd love to hear about what happened to your, to the claim against Rudolf. <laughs> thank you. Rachel, thank you so much. Um, we, we, I know we could continue talking for, for, um, for hours. We're a few minutes over. I just want to underscore what one of our listeners said. And this was such a clear and concise and, and really excellent um, presentation of a really complicated topic. And I just want to thank you again. Thank you, thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please like and subscribe to receive more content from the Leo Beck Institute.